Okay, Q&A time. Uh, so let me see what kind of questions we have uh, in the today's session. Um, I have a lot of questions popped up. Um, so Mr. Santosh is asking, uh, can you show me the definition of print in anonymous types? Uh, how does anonymous type able to print without writing a print method? Oh yeah, I understand your question. I think. Let me go back to the anonymous uh, types um, that we have discussed in detail. So we did talk about uh, anonymous types uh, in detail and uh, we did see that anonymous types can be created without uh, defining the class in advance. Uh, uh, so just to recap on that again, so we have a person class which is a concrete class definition which has all its uh, concrete members and we're able to uh, implement a print method there. So this is a print definition. I hope this is what you're referring to. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Um, to get, take a close look at this. So this is a print statement uh, that we have implemented uh, for our person met person class. Uh, this is a pretty stra uh, straightforward uh, string concatenation uh, where we, we have been using the statement uh, throughout our uh, most of the classes and uh, this is a pretty much uh, a placeholder to add the ID and also the name. Uh, this is another placeholder where we are popping up the name. So this is a pretty straightforward uh, implementation. So this is a string concatenation in other words. And if I run it, um, the output is going to be yeah, so as we have seen, so this is just like ID and you have the value for 100 and uh, name and 200 and name. And okay, so those are the two different types of uh, uh, instantiations in, uh, we have seen. One is uh, without, uh, with the default constructor, uh, one, one with the default constructor which doesn't have any values. We are initializing those set from, from the respective properties. Another case is uh, using the a object initializers. So using the object initializers, here also we are able to create a person instance p1 and call the print method for that. So, and we did see how the print definition is written just now. Okay. So the, I think the question is more tricky when it comes to the anonymous type. So this is where the anonymous type is, which we are in p2. Um, in this case, this is not a person class. So this is a kind of, uh, complete anonymous type just mimicking what we have done with the person. So we had it in a lot of code to have the same definition and with the anonymous type you don't have to write any code just have to um, start writing the attributes that you want to have as part of the p1 or instance and just start writing those uh, values and assigning them directly. So this is as good as uh, person class which you have written just now. And in this case, how I'm printing that is p uh, p2.2string. Uh, so surprisingly, if you take a look at the output of p uh, p2.2string, it is giving a lot of uh, very useful information out. So if you take a look at, close look at this again. Yeah, this is what Santosh is asking, uh, how, how does this two string able to print out uh, this whole thing like ID is equal to 200, name and everything. Uh, whereas I have to write uh, a custom definition for this. Okay, that's a very good question. So when we look at the internals, um, one step down into the how the anonymous type is uh, structured inside the MSIL, then we can actually drill down into the implementation of this two string also. So let me recompile this again and uh, drill down into the definition of uh, our output. Okay, we have a debug and within this I have, uh, okay, I'll copy this path. I want to open this whole thing in the ILDASM and diagnose what the implementation is written in to string. Okay, so this is because uh, implicitly the definition is implemented inside the to string itself for the anonymous tabs. Okay, uh, ILDASM. I'm just running the ILDASM tool to get into the details of uh, the implementation. And in this case, I'll just open the exe. Great. So if you take a look at this, this is the anonymous tab that we have defined. Um, 
So it's a special type of class altogether. Uh, the anonymous type is uh, treated completely as you see it's completely out of the namespace our normal namespace so if you drill down into our normal namespace, namespace sorry um, so this is the person class implementation that we have written completely wherein we have a print method right and if you take a look at the MSI of the my print statement so this is exactly what we have seen which is uh, ID with the placeholder and the name with the placeholder and the values, um, oops, so I had to go on the way straight. Yeah, so uh, values, I'm populating them with the ID. The MSI represents a getter of ID because the ID is a property and it is making call to the get portion of the ID and similarly get portion of the name. And it's getting populated. So that's how it is. So it's uh, plain what our implementation. And now getting to the anonymous types, the two string implementation, if I, if I expand this, and get into my two string. Uh, surprisingly, if you take a look at, to take a close look at this, all the properties and attributes what we have uh, specified, everything is available right now. It's all instance uh, properties available, and it has a uh, getters for ID, name, and SX. None of these I have implemented, right? Everything is uh, predefined within this based on the attributes that you we have passed in to create this anonymous type and implicitly it is uh, inferred to create a class in itself. But of course, uh, as we see the limitations, this, since this, is the, this doesn't fall into the namespace uh, and also it is, it, this doesn't fall into your inheritance hierarchy. So you cannot uh, inherit another classes used uh, with the anonymous types. Um, so in which case you have to go within the concrete class implementation. Okay. So enough uh, with that, but it's going to be long and we did cover all that just now in detail. Uh, coming back to this point of question, the two-string implementation, if it expanded, what we have in the two-string implementation. So it has all that definition for ID, name, and sex. Everything is implemented without um, us writing code for that. So that's the um, implicit implementation of the anonymous types so that we have seen so what will the person have the, does the person have a two string no it doesn't have a two string because it can inherits from uh, the uh, system dot object it does have a two string with the system dot object but in this case we haven't written anything for that so if we implement and override the base members two string implementation then we will see that definition here otherwise no uh, in this case, uh, for anonymous types, it has an overridden implementation of two string, and that's what we have uh, uh, seen just now. Hope that clarifies. So, your point. So, whenever you have a similar doubts, you can always open the uh, MS, uh, sorry, intermediate language disassembler and uh, diagnose the code and see how it's uh, written and uh, is it something uh, out of box or is it something we have to provide and so on. Hope that explains, uh, Santosh. And let me get into the next question. Um, next question is from Murthy. Can we use a link with collections also, or it is limited only to generic list? Okay, that's a very good question, uh, Murthy Garu. J uh, just want to comment this out. And get into our query expression. So we have seen all the internals of uh, how the link queries are uh, working. Uh, all the internals in sense we started with the anonymous methods and then we went, walked through the uh, lambda expressions so almost uh, two and a half hours we did walk, talk about the uh, lambda expression and various things uh, all those constraints and uh, whatnot and also we walked through the uh, some of the basic link queries and in most of the cases I use the uh, a generic list here where in the list of persons to do my to do the query so so the Muthi's question is um, whether this link is applicable only to these list or can we use other collections also uh, yes we can use the collections also all these things are referred to as um, uh, link to objects as we discussed and there are two more other flavors uh, of uh, link uh, the one is the link to SQL and also link to XML 
So we did not see link to SQL and link to XML, but we did talk about the expression trees, uh, wherein uh, and its uh, relationship uh, to convert the expression into the uh, the respective database engine query, so that it can work with the database also. So yes, the the answer to your question is that yes, uh, we can use the link to SQL with the object uh, collections also. Yep. Another question is, can you join two lists uh, with the, uh, resulting in a using a link query? So the, yeah, I think the question is about uh, how to can you join two different lists and produce a query out of it and to result out a a join query? Yes, we can do uh, that again. So let me take uh, a quick uh, Google. So I would like to uh, pass on some of information wherein you can see a lot of other examples. So link uh, L-I-N-Q, sorry, uh, link examples. If you just Google around with the link examples, there is a beautiful page in MSDN which will uh, which has a list of all the various different uh, uh, things that you can do with the link. And this also provides, uh, well, I think yep, samples. We, I think the page got redirected to some other place. Yeah, there you go. So these are the link samples wherein you can you see what all you can do with the links. So whereas you have a where clause here, a select clause here, uh, group group by clause and uh, aggregate functions, everything you can do using link. And the last bottom you see a join operators also. You can use the joining queries. You, in this case, we see the categories. Um, and the products and we are having a join query with the C in categories and P in products and uh, so on. So it's just like a SQL query uh, as I mentioned that this has its own expression and syntactically you have to be uh, it's kind of a different uh, programming altogether and if you're familiar with these SQL queries then it doesn't take long and also you don't have to memorize everything. So as I mentioned there's a lot of help out there in the community uh, pages like this one uh, and also there's a lot of other articles so whenever you come to a scenario uh, like your case so where you, when you want to join two different lists and your help is out there you can just go ahead and uh, browse through these examples and uh, apply that to your um, need okay so that is uh, uh, good to go for now, I think. And of course, as I mentioned, your link has three different flavors, and we did see one of them, uh, which is linked to objects, and also you have a link to SQL and link to XML. And yes, query expressions wise, they doesn't they don't change much. Only thing is um, just how to open the XML and how to read through it is one case, and in for link to SQL, how to connect to the database. Those are the things which will different. Otherwise, the queries wise, it doesn't change much. And there is one more page where I, uh, where I saw um, another, think uh, another interesting page wherein uh, it talks about link to SQL also. So um, yeah, so this is the one. So in this case, if you see a link query samples and link to SQL samples, if you see edu.net. Uh, interoperance. So this is a lot like we have a stored prox and all other things. Another question I see that uh, can we write, uh, uh, can we start writing link and forget about the stored prox? One of the students have asked uh, an earlier. Um, so can we get rid of uh, the writing the stored prox and uh, just r write link because everything you can do in link also. Um, so that's a case by case uh, decision you have to take. Uh, it's not. Uh, I wouldn't say that link is replacing the database queries. That's completely not true. So link is not replacing the database queries. That's you need to keep in mind. So there's a lot of performance enhancements that you can achieve by writing a stored proc wherein the execution plan is preserved once you compile uh, at the server side and uh, the execution plan can be reused by the uh, optimizers in the database engine side. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages you'll get, especially when you deal with the large database, uh, uh, large size databases. Um, so link uh, is uh, is useful to cases where um, your data stream is uh, limited and uh, small in scope, and uh, 
uh, for pity things you can make use of the link but definitely when there is a need to handle a large amount of data a uh, link is not going to be helpful but of course uh, in the 4.0 version we have a link uh, parallel link libraries added up uh, that has a benefit of using the multi core processors uh, on the hardware side and uh, make it uh, work for a large data sets also but again uh, stored procs are still going to be there uh, it's uh, link is not going to replace it completely okay so there are a lot of uh, exceptions cases wherein you still have to go and write stored procs but most of the cases uh, uh, wherein you, uh, if your data set is going to be very static and uh, always have limited scope like for example uh, 2000 records or 1000 records or less than you know hundreds of records there are so many things like uh, in a real time application so for example you have a take a, uh, a reference data or enterprise uh, master data uh, most of the sets like uh, for example uh, departments number of departments cannot be you know millions it can be it, it's always limited to a couple of tens like uh, 10 20 30 at the most uh, so those kind of data won't change uh, over a period of time so those kind of data you can bring into the application level and cache it somewhere and then reuse you, the queries uh, like the link um, and play around with them so in the in which case you don't have to hit the database server every time to get the static data all the time so those cases are the best candidates for uh, playing around with the link okay uh, that's uh, much detail we did talk a lot about that uh, just this is a Q&A session so I want to I want to limit it um, and uh, Murthy is an, asking uh, you wrote uh, yeah the cache uh, several times uh, how can you enable that okay cache I was referring to uh, many times and uh, Moth is asking how can we enable that there are multiple ways uh, number one is uh, if you use the enterprise uh, uh, library for caching which is called caching application block available in, uh, in the recent is the uh, enterprise library version 5.0 and we will be using the enterprise library in our live project which is going to start in a couple of uh, sessions from now um, and at that part I will show you the caching how to configure and how to use it so it's just a configuration part and uh, caching is primarily available for the web based applications uh, under the namespace uh, system.web.cache uh, and you can use that cache object to cache the uh, data uh, as well into it uh, and uh, of course in Windows applications you can still use the uh, Microsoft's uh, application blocks uh, enterprise library application blocks for caching and also you can leverage the same system.web.cache namespace into your Windows applications and implement the caching in Windows forms as well so that is doable so there are different ways to implement that and we will see more uh, more about the caching uh, and the session state and the application state all these uh, are the topics of our uh, uh, interest down the line when we jump into the ASP.NET uh, uh, topics okay for now uh, yes uh, it can be enabled using a configuration you can do it in the application uh, memory itself or you can uh, of course also persist it to, to a different persistent layer uh, in general and of course there are cloud services to uh, in the recent time there is a cloud services for caching also uh, Amazon has one of the caching product uh, that people use for large scale applications <coughs> excuse me and uh, last question I see from Muthi again uh, do you have a session on how we can migrate uh, code to higher environment environments especially the dependencies it works good in uh, so the applications do work good in Visual Studio but how to deploy the dependencies in server excellent question Mutigaru that's uh, one thing um, yeah since you asked the question now uh, let me uh, walk you through that so the question is simple so in in general when we are running in Visual Studio we have all these references a lot of other references I'm using so the application uh, is leveraging all these uh, uh, BCL which is base class libraries and how do we ensure that those libraries are shipped along with our uh, uh, code when we migrate to higher environments uh, that's an excellent question uh, only inexperienced people can ask such kind of questions so um, that's a very good question okay let's me jump into how we can uh, do that um, 
okay uh, there is another file here let me delete this file before we go on okay so this is uh, we did talk about how to deploy the Windows based applications to the higher environment. So in this case, if I just build this, uh, rebuild the solution, okay, and uh, we can see a rebuild all succeeded at the bottom. And now I can go into the bin folder. In this case, since I build this in a debug mode, which I set here. So that's why I have the build, and we did talk about all this uh, in the past, right? So a simple deployment. How we? How do you do a simple deployment? Uh, in this case, all the files I need here is uh, the exe. Another file is a DLL. So in my case here, I don't have any uh, uh, configuration file. Otherwise, you will have a a config file. Uh, otherwise, it's usually is app.config. Otherwise, it will end up with the exe name uh, with the extension config. Okay, and right now, just copy these two files, and uh, I just have to go and uh, deploy to any. This is called X copy deployment. I'm not, I, although I'm not doing an X copy here because we don't have a big tree structure of uh, files. Uh, uh, which you will normally have. Where is this? Yep. Yeah. So just uh, this is the deployment, right? I just uh, dump those uh, files into a new location. So uh, if you have a couple of other subfolders within this, then uh, in that case uh, you will make a real difference of an X copy versus normal copy. A normal copy like this uh, just copies the files from the root. Uh, X copy will copy the complete uh, tree structure. For example, if you have an images folder within that, or resources folder, or documents folder, or PDF folder, or whatnot. So you might have a root or a tree, complete tree list of uh, uh, folder structure for your deployment, uh, wherein your application is looking to the respective uh, paths. So in which case, uh, the X copy makes a big difference. So X copy is the uh, simplest way to deploy. Once I deploy it, I just have to run this application. As you see, this is running perfectly good, right? And uh, yes, the question comes here. So since the dependencies, we were referring to the dependencies. What are the dependencies here? In the references, it's, it uses the base class library. And uh, base class library of what? Which framework? Uh, that you can see from the target framework, right? Um, this is the target framework. And you might, I think we did already talk about what is the client profile. I don't want to uh, distract here. So in simple, the client profile is a, 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 sh a smallest version of the, um, the .NET Framework 4.0 version. This is specific for the client machines uh, whose size is much concise and small for the uh, for the installation at the client side. If you're hosting this like, click once uh, deployment, uh, and uh, they have to download it from the web, then client profile DLLs are going to be much concise and simple and specific to what you need um, versus, uh, versus having a server specific uh, for, for .0 version libraries. That's the difference between the client profile and the normal uh, 4.0 profile. Okay, so this is the dependency on my application and and uh, since I am running on my machine and all these references were added from my machine, so since and my machine has a Visual Studio 2010 which comes with the uh, .NET Framework 4.0, it is part of my own machine so I don't have to worry about having those dependencies installed in my machine. So what if it is a brand new server on the destination? Which doesn't have a .NET framework, uh, framework, uh, the given framework or required framework to run. So in that case, this is going to fail, right? So one thing you need to make sure that the framework uh, is uh, installed on the given server. And we did see the server list of machines which comes out of box by default. So the .NET framework version is, ships along with most of the uh, servers. Uh, by default, but uh, depends upon the version of the server, you may not, may or may not have a 4.0 with it. Um, so, in which case, you have to install the 4.0 version uh, manually. Okay, and make sure that's a one-time setup. If you install the .NET Framework over there, uh, 4.0 there, and just X copy your uh, DLLs, then this is good to go. You can just start running this program there. 
Okay, that's step one number one. There's a lot of complete uh, manual steps involved, right? So there's another way to do it to to simplify uh, all that manual step uh, steps. Uh, that's by using a set of projects. Um, so I'll just uh, since we have this question now, I'll uh, quickly run through that as well and add a project. Uh, I'm going to create a set of project uh, which will guide me. Yeah, there you go. We have a setup and deployment under other project types. Uh, and uh, in this case, I'll go to Visual Studio Installer and pick this setup project. Okay, you have other types of projects, uh, setup projects as you see for CAB and setup wizard. If you have uh, multiple levels of forms, then you can do that and the web setup and all, all the things. For the point of our interest, uh, I'll pick this setup one and say okay. So as you see, it is a very uh, simple thing here. And uh, if you go to the uh, properties of this setup project, there's one thing called the prerequisites here. So there is a uh, button here called prerequisites. You hit into that and it will see that it's already recognized that my uh, project is using uh, .NET Framework 4.0 client profile uh, for both x86 and 64 architecture. And in this case, uh, is there any other things that he's referring to? There is one more call, it could be installer, because this is a setup project which is using the other um, dependencies. So how the setup is going to take it? So what it's, it has is three more options here. Specify the install location for prere prerequisites. In this case, download the prerequisites from the components vendor's website. That means the website URL is already part of it. Once you do it, uh, it will download the respective dependencies subject that the uh, machine has an internet connection. It's going to go and download and install it along with it. Or you can also specify that um, uh, uh, redistributable uh, dependent file, which is in this case the .NET 4.0, uh, by picking this option and browsing to the respective uh, uh, DLLs and add it to it or the respective MSI, so whatever it is um, you pick. So in this case, this is where you're going to set it. In this case, I will leave the default here and uh, say OK. OK. And that's all you need at this point. And this is going to spit out an uh, MSI. That's my output uh, under my debug folder. It's going to uh, MSI stands for Microsoft Installer. OK. And uh, say OK. That's where you need. So now I have to associate my project, which is going to be deployed. How do I do that? I just have to right click on the setup project and go and add project output and I see a primary output. Within the primary output, the project name here I pick is the uh, C Sharp 3.0 features demo and say OK. And that all it takes and we see the detected uh, dependencies. It picked the uh, .NET Framework uh, version and also the DLL. Uh, because that's my custom, as we discussed about the extension methods, that's my custom uh, extension, which is referred uh, here in this project, right? So since it has a reference to that, and this is another custom DLL, it added that also as part of my setup. And now, that's all I need right now. So a couple of um, uh, property settings uh, you might want to do, in this case, uh, what I meant is like title, I will say my my setup. Okay, I just uh, put a uh, some descriptive one. Uh, my setup project and uh, what others are optional. If you want to uh, uh, give them or not, that's fine. So I'm going to leave them uh, as is. I'll just add some description also the same name. Okay, I'm done. Now I'm going to rebuild this whole thing. And once the build is done, what I'm going to get is, uh, yeah, we can see that the see, uh, rebuild all succeeded. What it's going to do, I'm going to go and open the open folder in the Windows Explorer and see the debug and I see an exe and a MSI files created. So this is what I need to uh, ship it for installing in the destination server. In which case, if I run any of them, uh, okay, I pick the exe and run this. You can see the installer and uh, the setup one wizard is open and you can pick the respective path in which case uh, I have this path. So I'm going to clean this up. Okay. 
and uh, take this path okay and uh, yeah just for me that's fine I'll take all the defaults and I'm going to install it so it's taking a little time um, let's wait for that so there you go so this is uh, Windows 7 so it, it shows the publisher as unknown and uh, there are a couple of steps that you need to make this application trusted by creating a certificate using a cert manager a couple of steps involved to get rid of this unknown publisher so if the the application that you're running is under the trusted domain uh, on your machine then it's not going to prompt for this and to have to do that you have to have a, a certificate uh, assign the exe with the certificate uh, and then it will get rid of that uh, uh, so for now if I just say yes that's fine it's going to go ahead and create and you might have seen the uh, the, uh, the certificate vendors like the VeriSign is one of the popular uh, vendors so for real-time production like application you have to buy a valid certificate and then sign your exe and do all that uh, uh, code access security part of it uh, you have to trust the you have to make the uh, application trust to uh, run on the respective machines okay that's a different story altogether so now the application is installed in my machine since again I have my 4.over framework installed on this machine it does it didn't um, try to reinstall that so the setup project is smart enough to do all that and once it is done I just have to double click on this and it works as good as it okay what's another addition um, uh, advantage of having this setup project is uh, it will add all that you require for your program also for example if I try to uh, rerun the yeah, so if I try to rerun this uh, setup project, you can see that it's going to do a repair and uh, remove. So just like a normal installer, you, we have created one. Yeah, and of course, you can customize this whole thing. Um, so in this case, uh, you can uninstall it or reinstall, like uh, repair it. Okay, I'm, I'm canceling that. And in, in addition to that, so just uh, unlike Xcopy, this has um, more to integrate with the uh, windows how the applications are created and uh, removed so in this case if I want to uninstall I can also go to my programs uh, and uh, look for uh, I think this is uh, where is my this is my setup project or just setup project yeah I think this name is still setup one uh, yeah this is the one and I can have as you see I can uninstall from here also okay yes so I'm removing that and reinstall so all these are part of the windows so that's the advantage of having a setup project and uh, this is using this you can do uh, deployments to other environments as well okay in this case now I'll run MSI it's the same wizard you can do either of them which is fine I still have that yep perfect and uh, reinstalling the same application again after uninstalling so you see the steps of uninstalling and reinstalling so all these uh, need to take place okay and another way to do it is you can also publish uh, this whole thing we'll see that in a moment right now and uh, this is how you can do it and alternatively you can also do that from your Visual Studio itself right click on this and pick the install and uninstall instead of doing going to the respective folder and running that setup you can actually do it from here also in this case I'll just uninstall it okay let's give it a minute okay the same um, same processes work to install and uninstall and if I uninstall it do I have these files no those are gone and uh, what else we have and uh, yes the other one I'm talking about is a click once deployment um, you can do that right click by right clicking on this and just publish and uh, in this case uh, let's say test deploy and then say finish 
and it is actually publishing the runtime like this as you see so you can host this setup on a given uh, if your uh, this application is specific to your LAN based uh, network uh, within your office for internet intranet use then you can host this on a server and then uh, give the path to the users to download and install um, and click once deployments also need to be to have an elevated trust uh, and then only they can run so if you take a look at this this dialog is a little different so this is going to install uh, the same way but from a uh, link and you can just directly run this uh, from the respective link okay so this is another way to uh, have the deployment and it does carry all the files required uh, along with it uh, for deploying and everything else okay so the publish feature you can use to have this click one features and also uh, there's more about the code access security security wise you can go and enable a click um, enable the click once uh, security settings and uh, for more information on that area you can also take a look at this link on the code access security and uh, wherein you have to enable your application for a full trust or a partial trust you need to have a full trust on the applications if your application needs a file system access directly to create delete modify files on the system otherwise the partial uh, is also fine so this this topic itself is a lengthy we will may we may cover this down the line whenever there is an opportunity and for now uh, i think i answered um, mr murthy's question uh, this is how you will carry the dependencies along with your project to the higher environments so that's a very good question and uh, yes so that's my uh, motto is ask more questions and uh, you will learn more uh, I will I will uh, try to deliver as much as I can um, and you can trigger that only by asking the right question okay and if you don't have any questions further um, then we can wind up for the day bye for now